take a look around. We're together, guys. We're here. I, I'm like emotional uh, sitting there singing. I'm not joking, man. I have missed you guys so badly. I don't know if it's mutual or not, but um, here we are. So, so glad. Um, and you guys are here early, 8 in the morning. Wow, that's, that's impressive. I, wow. I, it's, it's a big change from the last few weeks when I know there's a few of us who have stayed in our pajamas and watched church at, at 10. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I just kind of want to have, have dialogue all morning here just because I miss you guys. Man. Oh. Amen. Um, on the 21st, it's Father's Day. And we are planning a, a big get-together. Um, the Dannons are going to smoke up some ribs and chicken. And so uh, if you don't have plans for, for Father's Day, please stick around. It'll be after the second service. But uh, if you want to come to the first, come back later. It just Let's just celebrate. Let's just hold on to this as long as we can. This, this understanding and valuing togetherness. And another thing, uh, gosh, I just, I'm going to be rattling today just because I miss you guys all so much, but I feel like I have to, all these words I have to get out, right? I was just thinking while we were sitting there, you know, just how good this is and how I knew I needed it, but I almost didn't know how badly I needed it, right? We're we're at risk, okay? We're because we need each other. We're at, as Christians, we understand we're at risk all the time, and and we need each other, and, and it makes this moment great. And I was just thinking, when we see Jesus face to face, then we're really gonna see what we've been missing. Then we're really gonna say that uh, all this time here as as a pilgrim, right? Ab- like Abraham was a pilgrim, just pitch tents, never built himself a a home. He never bought a stretch of property because he, he looked for that kingdom whose builder and maker was God. And once we are there and seeing Jesus face to face, we're going to realize how badly that's what we need is him. Amen. Hey, um, let's open up our Bibles. I can say that and watch people open their Bibles. This is amazing. Uh, turn to uh, Galatians chapter six, if you would. We have been making our way through the book of Galatians. I certainly hope, uh, I know that there's some challenges at home too, but I certainly hope you've been able to to follow along with us, that you've been able to to watch or or listen online because it's been an incredible journey. And the book of Galatians genuinely can drastically alter how we understand our relationship with the Lord, almost more than any other book, right? And so, uh, but here we are. Right at the end of it now, there was our last study in the book, and we're going to be looking at some, just some concluding thoughts here by the Apostle Paul. And, and next week, we're just going to keep rolling and going right into Ephesians. And so um, I'm looking forward to that because Ephesians is a book about our identity. It's about who we are and then how, how we fit in to the church, how we fit into the world, in the relationships around us, because of who we are, how does that transfer into the world that we're living in? And so if you've never gone through a study of of Ephesians, or even if you have, stick around, man. Hang on with us. We're going to have a great time going through the book of Ephesians, and that's going to be transformative. I'm looking forward to that as well. And so uh, your homework, read the book of Ephesians this week, and let's come back and and grow together, all right? Well, uh, we've made it as far as uh, verse 11 of chapter 6, and Galatians is a book about grace, right? If you haven't gotten that yet, you're, you're, you're missing the point. It is from grace from first to last, as we'll see. And, and grace, if you're not familiar, grace is, is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve, and it's by grace, by simply trusting in Jesus, there's nothing we have to do but believe and have faith and trust that he has, through his death, 
made us right with God on, uh, on the cross, that he has done it all. Now, opposed to grace, that's what it means to, to live in grace. Opposed to that are works, right? Works are anything that we do that we think are going to make us right with God. This is what's going to make us... No, grace is you're already right with God because of what Jesus did. Works say, well, I got to do things to, to be, be right with God. But there, there's not one thing you can do. It's not having the right view on a social justice issue or following certain rules or regulations or what you, how you do your makeup or what your facial hair is. None of that makes you more right with God. You are as right with God right now if you success with Jesus as you ever will be because all of our righteousness comes from him. Now, let's pick up in verse 11. I just kind of summarized the book of Galatians here for us. And now let's see Paul's concluding thoughts. He says in verse 11, See with what large letters I've written to you with my own hand. Oh, man, there's a lot of people wanting their message heard today. And Paul was no exception then. Uh, you know, this is like John Hancock, right? Not Herbie Hancock, uh, but John Hancock, who wrote big cursive, you know, signature on the Declaration of Independence because he wanted King George III to see his name there. This is a Declaration of Independence, of freedom, and I want you to know I was a part of this. And this is Paul's Declaration of Freedom. That's what Galatians is. It's a declaration of freedom and grace. And now he says, man, I'm, I'm doing this with my own hand. More than just proving that he wrote the letter, uh, which it does, but it's kind of like adding extra emphasis. It's like bolding something or putting something in italics. It's, it's like Paul says, give me that quill, okay? I've, amanuensis is the word for it where you dictate and someone writes it down in that world. And, and Paul says, okay, I, I let me finish this book out because I want people to see this is for me. And I've got an eye problem and I'm going to have to write big but I, it's going to be all caps, but people are going to get this, what I want to say. This is what I want to say, Paul says, verse 12. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel or pressure you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. This is what I want you to get. This is what I want you to see, that there's some out there that want you. He's talking to Christians. There's those out there who want you to follow their rules. That's what they're about. He says there's many, and they're telling you that you've been bought by the blood of Jesus, but that's not enough. There's more for you to do. That isn't, that isn't going to cut it. That isn't going to make you as righteous as you could be or should be. There's, thing, there's performance involved. There's religious activity involved to make sure that you are as righteous as you can be to God. And, and for, for in Paul's day, it was circumcision, right? But the legal list will always have a legal list. They will always have, you got to do this, you can't do that. This is how to be righteous. This is how to make yourself more right with God. The legalist always has a legalist because it's all religion to them. That's what it is. It's outward. It's religious. It's, it's about performance and, and, and making sure you jump through these hoops and you can do this and you can't do that. But Christianity that Paul is preaching, the gospel, is not religion. It's what? It's relationship, right? It's having a relationship with Jesus. And Paul says the reason that many are doing this, the reason for this, the reason that legalism exists is here, he says, so they can make a good showing in the flesh. For many, the ministry is about a reputation. It's about making sure we look good while we're doing it. And he says, and he adds, and so they can avoid persecution. Now, it could be that they're trying to, obviously, avoid the consequences of being a Christian, believe in Jesus, that's fine, these, these Judaizers would say, but you have to do these other things as well. You know, you got, you got to follow this feast and dietary laws, and of course, for them, circumcision. Now, I don't want to get hung up on this too long, but the Greek word here for persecution can be translated pursue, and it is in, in other passages in the scripture. For example, in 1 Timothy 6, 11, Paul says, but thou, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness. That's the same word as persecution used here. And so maybe that's what it's leading towards. Or in Hebrews 12, verse 4, it says, pursue peace with all men. Not persecute peace. 
right? It's pursue peace. And so, again, I don't want to get too bogged down with this. This is, you know, a little bit of speculation maybe, but maybe that's what Paul has in mind here, that, that the legalist is out there. There's many of them out there, and they want to make the flesh look good, and so they avoid grabbing hold of pursuing the cross. They avoid the cross because the cross doesn't make them look good. Why, like, why would you avoid the cross? What, 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 is the, what does the cross mean? The cross says, I'm not good enough. The cross says, no one is good enough. The cross says, you can't make yourself right with God. The cross says, I can't make myself right with God. The cross says, in me dwells no good thing. I need a sacrifice on my behalf. The cross says, my efforts to be right with God aren't going to cut it. And so people don't like to be useless, right? Right? No one likes to be useless. And so the legalists, they want to make a good showing in the flesh. It validates them. I'm not going to emphasize the cross because that that points out how needy I am. But but legalism, if if rules draw attention to the rule keeper and the rule breaker, the cross, all it does is draw attention to our need for Jesus. And so he goes on in verse 13, he says, For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to you, to have you circumcised, that they may boast in your flesh. Paul says the first thing you got to understand about these guys is they're a bunch of hypocrites. They're not even doing it all themselves. They're pressuring you to follow their rules, and they can't follow their own rules. I mean, they've got a ton of them, right? But for them, What's it about here? It's about nickels and noses. They want to boast in your flesh. They want to be able to count the converts and and count the the tithe, right? They don't care about the people. For them, it is outward, and so they don't care about the ministry. They want to add a person's name to the list. They want to boast in your flesh. They want to increase the membership. Well, that's how a church is really, that's how you can tell a church is doing the right thing, right? When the membership goes up. Paul says, no, man, that's what they're trying to do. That's not real ministry. They're doing whatever draws them more attention. They want to be noticed and they want to be needed because it feels a lot better, doesn't it, to be needed than to be needy. Is there anyone that will agree with that? They want to be needed and not needy, but the cross demands that you understand you're needy. It forces you to, to realize that, that I don't have it. We don't have all we can do as a church, as a ministry, as a person, is point to Jesus. Because I don't have it. I can't do it. Verse 14, he says, in contrast to that, he says, God forbid that I should boast or, or brag, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. Paul, let's see what he doesn't say here first, right? Paul doesn't boast, he doesn't brag in his own experiences or education, he doesn't brag in his own ability, he doesn't brag about the number of people he's led to the Lord, he doesn't brag about the number of churches that he's planted, and there has been a ton. In fact, he says, I'm not, God forbid, I even brag about myself at all, because all that stuff that the many are doing, that they're counting the nickels and the noses, I'm not a part of that. The world, the stuff, and all that's important to them is crucified to me. I'm dead to that, and that's dead to me. He doesn't boast about himself. And notice this. Notice also he doesn't, what he doesn't boast about Jesus. He says, I'm going to boast about Jesus. But even then, he doesn't brag about how Jesus multiplied bread and fish, proving that he was the God of creation. He doesn't brag about how Jesus was the one who called Lazarus, from the grave back to life, proving that he had the power over life and death. He doesn't brag about Jesus' sermons, the Sermon on the Mount. He doesn't, he doesn't boast about Jesus' healings or when he walked on water. There's a whole litany of things, this whole life that, of Jesus that he doesn't brag about. But what he does boast about is the cross, that his Lord, his Jesus, endured the crucifixion. And I'll tell you what, we read this very easily. But in the first century, this would have floored every single reader of this. He's boasting in the cross. The cross was an instrument of torture. 
of execution. You're boasting in that, Paul? He doesn't boast that his God is from another realm, untouched by and untainted by the selfishness of this world and all its injustices and the mob mentality and all of that. He boasts that his God, that he doesn't have to try to reach up to him, but his God came down to where he is. He boasts that his God was made flesh. His boast is that the Lord came into this broken, sin-sick world full of drug abuse, this world full of sexual perversion, full of diseases, full of COVID-19, full of viruses. Uh, He came into a world with cancers and, and children's hospitals. He came into a world with racism and hate and looters and violence. And Paul says, I'll boast about that, Jesus. That's the God I'm going to boast. That's what I can boast in, is that my God came into a world of sin to bear my sin, to make us right with the Father. That's the only thing worth boasting in. And friends, this is the gospel. This is the message that we are commissioned to share with the people around us in our mission field. And this is the message that people need to hear right now. I don't need to tell you our world is crying out for the gospel, for help. More than at any point in my lifetime. And so this is the message that Paul says I'll boast in because it's powerful enough to fix what's broken in this world. That's why he came. It's the only thing that can change a heart of a man. That's, Paul knows this firsthand. Paul was a terrorist. Paul was the mob. He was a rioter. Acts chapter 8 tells us he would break into people's houses and pull men and women off to prison. He knows that the message and the power of the cross of Christ is what set him free. It wasn't following any religious rituals. It was a God who came into this world and took its place. And he says, if it can change me, it can change anybody because you can't out-sin grace. Everybody is within the reach of grace. The racist, the bigot, the looter, doesn't matter. They're all within the reach of God's grace. Paul says, I'll boast in that. I'll boast in the cross because people don't need rules. They need Jesus. That's what this world needs. And if I can continue diverting just a little bit. If the last three months have taught us how badly we need this, how badly we need each other. We were created as social beings and, and we need each other to function the way that God has intended. If the last three months have taught us this, the last two weeks has showed us how badly our world is longing for righteousness. It's showing us how great the need is for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the news, uh, I don't want to get started. I don't want to get too off track. But it's full of ruthlessness and rebellion and racism and riots. And much of it is displaced, but all of it is a desperate cry for righteousness. Righteousness is God's perfect standard between right and wrong. And justice is the implementation of God's righteousness. In Psalm 89, verse 14, you tell me if this is what the world needs or not. It says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your presence. This is what people are longing for. When you click on the news, don't get angry. They're crying out. They can't formulate the words, but this is what they want. They want righteousness. They want justice for George Floyd. So do I, right? They want justice for small business leaders, who, uh, uh, owners who are having their businesses looted. I want that. They want, there, there's a call for justice for all these officers that are getting executed. I want justice for that. And it's because we, we want all of this righteousness it's only found in one place. 
It's found in Jesus. It's the cross. It's the cross that I'll boast in because it's the cross that brings the righteousness of God. And nothing else that any ministry or church or minister or organization, it can't do that. It's going to make its boast in something else. But Paul says, I will boast in the cross of Christ. And if you'll remind me, before we move on, to just look over at chapter 3, because this is so timely for the days that we live in. Just look over there for a minute in chapter 3, verses 27 and 28. He says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And Paul says, In Jesus, verse 28, if that's what you've done, if you're baptized, if you're in Jesus, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Racism, gone. There's neither slave nor free. All these social restraints and differences, gone. Male or female, you're all one in Christ Jesus. This is worth boasting in. Because at the cross, all the barriers of society creates that divide us, all of that is broken down when we are one in Jesus Christ. Paul says, that's something I can boast in. Amen? The cross is the only thing that matters because, verse 15, it's the only thing that makes us new. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Circumcision, uncircumcision, he said, it doesn't matter. I don't care. You, you line up 100 people, 50 of them circumcised, 50 of them uncircumcised. I don't know who's checking, but it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't mean a thing. I don't need your religious rituals, suits or, or jeans, dresses or slacks, having your hair this way, your clothes that way. It doesn't matter. None of that religiosity, none of the rituals matter because it doesn't make you more righteous. It avails nothing. It doesn't avail anything, he says. The only thing that matters is being a child of God, being a new creation, being born again. That's what matters. And so the question is not are you following this rule, but are you born again? Have you given your life to Jesus? That's what matters you could take all that religious stuff. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is Jesus and having your, your sins forgiven and being made right with God. This, again, is why the cross is worth boasting in. Verse 16. And as many as walk or live by, according to this rule, you want to keep rules? Here's the rule. Walk in the cross. Walk in the new birth. That's the rule to keep. As many walk according to this, this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Now, this is a little diss to Paul. He had some disses, okay? This is a little diss to those who are trying to come back to the Jewishness, this Jewish roots type of thing. And God has a plan for Israel, okay? That's proven in, in Romans 9, 10, 11. God has a plan for the nation of Israel, but the Israel of God, those who are governed by God, are those who live by the cross, those who are new creation, those who are born again, that's the Israel of God. That's where peace and mercy is found. And again, isn't that what our world wants right now? It's peace, mercy. Oh, it's only found in one place. Verse 17, from now on, let no one trouble me. I think this would be a great plaque on like Jim Dennison's desk or something. Just the first half of that verse. From now on, let no one trouble me, right? <laughs> he kind of says that all the time, so. No, from now on, let no one trouble me. Or, or we'd say, stop hassling me. For I bear in my body the marks or the stigmata of the Lord Jesus. Now, stigmata, some of you are like, oh, what's that? I've seen that in a movie. Stigmata is not some mystical phenomenon where you suddenly have the wounds of Jesus, Right? A stigmata, this word is used to describe brands that were placed on slaves that marked their status. And Paul says, I've been marked by the Lord. I've been branded by him and for him. I belong to him. So stop hassling me about the marks of circumcision. 
you can take that. I don't want, I don't want to hear any more of that because it does not compare to the marks that I bear from stonings and beatings and imprisonment that I've taken for the cause of Christ. Don't even talk to me about that. Finally, verse 18, he says, Brethren, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Now, Paul ends this epistle of grace with an appropriate word. Go with grace. Because as, as broken human beings, that's all of you. Okay. Yeah, that's us. We know deep down we're not worthy of this, right? We're not worthy of anything. And so we're always trying to find things that make us more worthy, that make us feel a little better. Like, oh yeah, I get it. Jesus, grace, that's fine. I understand. But now I need to really make sure that I'm right with God. I need to make sure that I stay right with God. And Paul says, go with grace. That's, that's the law when you're trying to make yourself right with, with the Lord. The law prohibits, grace invites. The law condemns a sinner, grace redeems a sinner. The law reveals sin, grace atones for sin. The law brings the knowledge of sin, grace brings redemption from sin. The law came by Moses, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The law demands obedience, grace gives the power to obey. The law says do and don't do. Grace says it is done. The law says keep working at it. Grace says it is finished. The law curses. Grace blesses. The law keeps us in bondage. Grace sets us free. The law pronounces death. Grace proclaims life. The law shuts the mouth of the unsaved, and grace opens the mouth of the worshipers. The law pronounces the best man guilty, and grace saves the worst man. The law says, give me your best. Grace says, receive the best. The law says, the wages of sin is death. Grace says, the gift of God is eternal life. The law says, the soul that hates sin shall die. Grace says, believe and live. Amen? It's all grace. It's always grace. Guys, come back and revisit this book of Galatians. It has been and will always be about grace. It's nothing about what you can do to be made right with God. It's all what he has done for us. All that is left for us is to receive it, to take it in. Every, every, all the credit in the world, we get none of it. It all goes to Jesus. And so Paul says here in this final verse, this final word, go with grace. Because this is what the world needs. The world needs to see you dependent upon Jesus. Uh, That's what the world needs. Don't wait for the the world to to look to someone else. This is your calling to to have the world that's lost and crying out for the gospel to see the gospel at work in your life. Amen? Let's pray.